Uh, these are party dresses from our new uh, diffusion line called Love Movement, which we're going to be launching in summer this year. It's basically a diffusion line that we created to drive accessibility. Often we have uh, mothers who come into our store with their daughters and they fight over the garments that they wanted to, want to buy. So we decided to create a diffusion line that would um, be younger, fresher, and that's really premised on the belief that the only real power in life is love. So the whole thing is about spreading love and it's linked to a broader campaign um, that um, seeks to basically inspire people to, to spread love. That's great. Yeah. Um, you've been cult appropriating cultural references from Sophia Town and Steve Biko um, for a long time. Can you tell us a bit about what, what about that inspires you? Um, Stone Cherry was established in 2000. It was about six years after um, our first democratic elections. You know, people were very enthusiastic and optimistic about our future because we had gone through a transformation in a relatively easy way. Um, and at the time, we wanted to create a brand that would be an expression of African urban culture. We wanted to explore identity and culture and to really try and understand in a period where we were trying to negotiate a new identity what it means to be African in the 21st century post-apartheid um, South Africa. So um, obviously when you look at culture and identity, history is a very big part of that. And um, you know, I grew up in Soweto in, in the heights of apartheid. So uh, my references obviously will always relate to, to that era. But we also you know, were very inspired by what happened in the 50s. If you look at 50s, the 50s in Sophia Town as an era, it was a very colorful period. Although we were in the heights of repression and all of that, there was, you know, people still loved and laughed and lived. And that's basically that spirit of resilience that existed in that time and that, and that um, urban energy is, is something that we will always reference. The icons who represent that area, like Steve, B Steve Bantubiko, um, people who, are, you know, who've inspired us and brought us to where we are today. So, those references are always um, references that we, you know, that we draw our inspiration from. Kenzani, I think we're going to see um, shots from your most recent show at South African Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. But can you tell us a bit about how you're taking this philosophy into the future with the work that you do? Um, you know, we've often been challenged about, okay, so Sophia Town was an era, how do you move on? And I think, you know, our history is part of who we are. And, and one of our objectives when we started was to destigmatize South African history because we always had such a black mark you know next to our name in terms of you know where we came from and we wanted to take that and basically take some of our icons out of the dusty archives of history and make them part of popular thinking so it's something that we'll always do it may not always be in terms of silhouette and a very specific styling but it'll always be about that spirit of, of resilience that urban energy um, that tension all of those things will always influence what we do. And we always bold in our expression. That's something that'll never change. That's very true. Amanda, you also use a lot of local references in your work. Um, Kosa blankets, shwe, shwe fabrics, um, traditional Zulu, Indian um, fabrics as well. Can you tell us a bit about your approach to appropriation? What we have here is um, I explored when settlers came to South Africa, what were they wearing? And there was Edwardian influences, uh, colonial influences, um, Victorian. And what did they expect the people who were already living here to wear? Did they try and make them wear things that they felt were appropriate? Um, did they force them to cover their bodies? Um, I think these were issues at the time. Um, so these particular garments are from a range that, that expresses that. Um, the girl's outfit you can see has, um, the, when the coat was on, it, it sort of has a connotation to shape and illusion of Saki Bartman. Um, and then underneath, a whole lot of different layers just expressing our history, uh, our memories and passing of time. Um, and then to bring it to now, just um, the soccer ball, <laughs> which is something that's in our future. Um, it's also deconstructed and reversible, um, just to show that uh, we, we're playing around with who we are, where we've come from, and, and where we need to go, um, but all in a very positive way. 
and I feel it's just wonderful to be able to access the, the many interesting pockets of cultural influence that we have um, available in a clothing form. Um, the guy's outfit sort of has illusions of um, in the courts uh, and, and uh, layering again and uh, a tie that um, is straight off the collar that um, sort of is a combination of a modern tie and an old tie with an asymmetric finish. Um, and then just, you know, when I say about the courts, I think maybe it's a subconscious, like hoping that our, our laws will sustain and, and keep us uh, safe. Can, um, your cultural references are harder to pin down. One finds individual pieces that uh, might refer to specific cultures, but on the whole, you see more concern with the interplay between femininity, formal construction, and tailoring. What, what is your work about? For me, it's a bit different. I think uh, I, I, I tend to kind of look at traditional cultural skills and kind of make, take them into a different level. So if you look at the cocktail dress that Laurie is wearing, for instance, if I was walking around the beachfront and I saw a woman who was doing some traditional Zulu beading and she was using it in a crochet technique. And I ended up being in France and I went to see Solstice who produce amazing lace and I said, look, I think you could use this in terms of creating an amazing fabric. And it's now in our cruise collection for 2008 um, as a cocktail piece. So I look kind of more closely at the things that are happening in the country in terms of manufacturing techniques or existing cultural techniques. So for instance, the tailoring for me being based in Cape Town, Cape Town has a vast kind of cultural legacy of tailors. Um, and you can, you can trace it right down to the kind of migration of Lithuanian Jews had kind of settled here and, and passed on their kind of skills. So for me, it's more about kind of using those skills, but taking it and creating it, taking it into commercial space, because as a designer, it's about really selling garments and being out there. And at the same time, you kind of getting something which kind of um, I can be strong off in terms of differentiating myself in the marketplace internationally. So if I can use a traditional skill or a technique or something that I've learned here, take it in and kind of put it into my range, but also make a commercial kind of feature out of it, it's great. Um, for instance, this season I've been working with um, a lot of kind of silk-based fabrics which have been trying to be, uh, the CSR is working in terms of creating for South Africa. So they're made out of Mapani silkworms. Um, and at the same time, I'm working with kind of people in the UK. So, for instance, the suiting that Piero is wearing is um, has got a kind of heat-resistant quality to it. So it's about futuristic fabrics, innovative kind of fabrications, keeping the body cooler, looking towards the future. Um, and so I look at more kind of all those kind of different things. And I don't think really my cultural references are necessarily very obvious because I think for me as a designer I want to be inspired by different things and the fact that I'm actually in South Africa doesn't mean that always it's going to be my inspiration. Let's, let's pose this to all three of you. Uh, what, do, what do you guys think the function of fashion is? <laughs> to look more beautiful of course. <laughs> um, I guess in, I mean if you look at the rest of the world um, Fashion in, in, in places like the US and the UK, you know, the industries there are huge and they generate millions and millions of dollars. In South Africa, industry is about, I think fashion contributes about 35 billion to our GDP of about 1.7 so, trillion. Um, so I think it has the potential to be a, a real economic driver. Um, but we've got a lot of um, challenges, obviously, in terms of manufacturing, and the industry is still a bit young. Um, but I think there is infinite uh, potential to grow it into a real concern um, if we sort out some of our issues. Um, obviously, right now, the, the fashion industry um, is driven by your big retail chains, and um, the local designers are really a tiny little component. And I think things are starting to, to turn around with department stores, realizing that you know, there's a lot that's happening locally. You went to the expo, there's so much talent, but I think there still isn't enough of a dialogue between commerce and, and design and, and, and fashion design and local designers. Uh, but I think it's something that is developing and if, if we put the resources behind it and we sort out some of the issues that we have around manufacturing and distribution, because distribution is really the biggest barrier um, for a lot, of, a lot of designers. But I think 
if we tap into you know, the culture of craft mm. in the country, then we can really uh, use it to, to create employment. Um, yeah. Amanda, your take on the function of fashion? Well, I think fashion is mostly horrible, but clothing can be beautiful, and I take a different view of, of the question. Um, and its function is to explore and express our existence in a material form. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, by what we wear, we say something about ourselves. Um, we say where we see ourselves um, in society, and I believe that we do this whether it's conscious or subconscious. God, she so stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> think quick, think quick. <laughs> um, I think for me, more and more as I grow my business, I look at the function of fashion and I think it's, you know, for two levels on a corporate level, I think firstly, I, and in, t in the terms of working in South Africa, being based here contextually, I think I have a sense of responsibility and accountability to kind of young designers and perhaps also the community at large. So we try, I, I can only speak for myself here, but I think as a corporate, we try to be kind of a little bit more considerate to, to what's happening out there in the fashion industry, what's happening there out in society. And I think fashion is about change. It reflects change. And I think certainly for us as designers in our country and South Africa, and we are a very young democracy, you can see it very, it is a very kind of, it's reflected very evidently in, in kind of all the collections you've seen over the last kind of 10 years coming out of this country. The sense, great sense of patriotism. Um, and it's also kind of, prompted a lot of dialogue, um, not necessarily maybe very progressive dialogue with the Department of Trade and Industry, but um, you know, it has got people talking. Um, and that's the very interesting thing, is that actually fashion can reflect what's happening in the current space that we're actually in. We're going to turn the, dim the lights a bit and um, have a little sneak look back at um, Amanda's show from Design Dobby Expo a few days ago. She collaborated with Jay Pather, um, and it, it's quite an experimental show. I'd started speaking a little bit about your influences for the show, but could you expand on that and just talk about putting this together? I think that um, for me, the accessing in inspiration from our South African culture is a combination of a very instinctive, visceral attitude and some research. Um, and my intention is to esteem and expose what I think is so beautiful in our country and to promote debate, um, that we look at uh, stereotypes uh, and turn them upside down and let's talk about them, let's um, put them out in the open. And it's been my way of questioning my country and my place in the country for more than 20 years. Amanda, you've spoken um, about fashion being a political choice and wanting to design clothes that reflects the South African climate. Would, uh, would you expand? Um, I just feel that um, there's so many ways in which people say the way that a, a, a dancer wears beads, whether it's the little grey seed beads that you find on the side of a river, or glass beads um, that crisscross. And I, I've often used like that sort of thing into a, a, a very hopefully fresh and international context. And to me, that's just um, putting um, aspects of culture, it's, it's, and this picture, that picture there is inspired by Indebele, and um, it's, it's not taking it literally. I avoided Indebele for so many years because I hated the way that it was always done in such an airport curio manner, um, and uh, when I accessed it, it was totally not using any of the colors. Um, but just using elements of the shapes. So the fact that that felt um, tunic forced her to keep her head up is the same thing as is done by the beaded concentric rings on her neck. So it's really playing with elements to 
evoke a feeling of culture, um, but to and, and the hat that she's wearing as well um, is directly inspired by what Indebele married women wear. Um, and it's just my way of looking at culture and making a statement. In terms of production, choosing South African fashion has become a political choice. I think Ken Sani touched on this earlier. Um, how's the South African textile industry since China? Can we reprise it? How much production of your, all your production is done in South Africa? Um, well, for us, we do 100% of our production here currently. Um, but as I said before, it's, it's incredibly challenging because we do have a number of issues that we need to work around. One of the issues being if, if for instance, you have an interest to export your clothes, um, you know, export is quite price sensitive and in this country we've got expensive labor in comparison to China, obviously. Um, and we also have a few limitations in terms of what we produce. For instance, if you want to make authentic denim in South Africa, it is a little bit more challenging than it would be in other parts of the world, maybe. Uh, you, you also don't have a lot of factories who do fine um, gauge knits and things like that. So um, I think we, there are a number of issues that we need to work out. We also recently have the, the, you know, the challenge um, around power failures and, and, and that. So it does affect productivity. I think it also depends on what you're trying to do because if you have a niche market um, that you're servicing locally, then perhaps it isn't a problem. It, doesn't, it depends on where, which space you want to play. Um, if you're looking to produce volume, it starts becoming you know, something else. But I think once South Africans become sensitized to the fact that local, if you make a choice to buy locally made goods, you're going to pay a little bit more than you would pay if it's you know, something that's coming in from the East. Um, so I think you know, in, in the last five years, or maybe not five years, but in 2005, I think there were about 50,000 jobs lost in the te textile sector because all the factories were closing down. Um, and I think there's a whole complex debate with government trying to uh, impose quotas to try and remedy that. But it's a whole complex uh, matrix that I think through dialogue, we can, you know, we can try and find solutions. Well, I have a big problem in, in our area. Um, we can't go to a, lo a local mill and buy fabric because our quantities are too small. Um, so what happened in the last um, 15 years is that the, the mills used to carry stock and a, a person like myself could go and buy 50 to 300 meters. Now you phone them up and they say, well, you can have 2,000 meters per color, which I don't use. So they've, they've, they've focused on the chain stores um, so there are still mills producing for the chain stores, but nothing in, in our arena, it's, it, it is a problem. But we are you know, hoping that they will see us as a collective because there are a lot more entrepreneurial designers who have sprung up with their own businesses. Um, and collectively, there's enough of us. We just need the mills to wake up. Can anybody help us? <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, I think it can be reprised if someone was prepared um, to, to take the risk, uh, to do it intelligently. Um, and I loved what was said yesterday where they said, you know, um, it's, you know it's a risky business, but um, it's, those are the more creative ones, and if it works, it's amazing. Gavin? Uh, well, for me, I think, like, you know, I'm so tired about China, 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 because the whole world's affected by China. We're not the only people in the, country, in the world that's not affected by China. And yes, I don't agree with, like, all the kind of things that are coming into the country. And if you look at 2001, we had 139 million units imported into the country. Last year, we had 567 million units imported into the country from China. We have the Department of Trade and, 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 and Trade and Industry, which has put together or has put together a whole plan in terms of quotas that are coming to the country. It's about to expire, and it's two years, ten months down the line, and they still haven't actually come up with a strategic vision in terms of how they're going to save the industry. <clears throat> We're down to 51,000 jobs in the actual country in terms of people who are formerly employed in the clothing and textile industry. 
Um, and all of this was like seen coming years ago, but nobody actually stopped to do that. You have chain stores um, in the country who I agree, like what Ken Sani says, you know, don't necessarily make it very easy for, for manufacturers out there because they're always about pricing, always about knocking them down, or they're always about trying to steal someone's idea and trying to turn it into their own. Um, and Ken Sani we has a very mention, fantastic story about that. But we won't mention any names. Yeah, but I hope they're sitting here feeling very ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Um, and likewise, you have mills who actually can produce amazing textiles and can't do it because they don't have, um, you know, they, we don't have the capacity to buy 50,000 meters of fabric locally, but, you know, they could do amazing things if they have people like Amanda use their things and show them how to perhaps also work with it in a different way. And also there's no collaboration. People are very scared of collaboration in this country. So, you, you know, instead of like getting one of the mills to actually really and hopefully they're listening out there, Amanda, but to work with you on your new collection, perhaps see if they can create something which is an amazing product which the rest of the world will want to buy. They don't really want to take that. So I don't really think they value fashion and fashion design as such in terms of like what it can do. I mean, right now in the country, you know, if some very important dignitary goes somewhere and, you know, there's a few important people, then we call upon to do some shows. If there's a bit of a charity auction going somewhere, called upon to give donate address. So, I mean, I think it's about time they start taking us a bit seriously. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kenzani, you have your own boutique and you supply one of our largest retailers, Woolworths. Um, and you've also been lucky enough to have a lot of media as well around your, your range. Um, can you tell us about growing your business and what kind of insights you gain from the American Business Mentorship Program that you attended recently? Um, yeah, this is basically our eighth year of existence. And um, I think uh, for the last seven years, we've basically been surviving because there's a lot of, you know, as you say, there's the whole media aura, a lot of hype that gets generated through, um, you know, platforms like Fashion Week. And of course we need that um, to, to spark people's interest and desire in our products. But I think that it's been a huge learning curve for us because, you know, we started with very little and just very boldly did it without necessarily fully understanding what retail is all about and without fully understanding the importance of Sure, the passion and the creativity and all of that is there in abundance, but it's not enough to take you all the way. And they're very um, basic business principles that if you don't apply, you are not going to survive. It's just as simple as that. So I think um, when I was selected as, as a, an Endeavor um, uh, entrepreneur, which is what you, you, you're termed, it was, a, it was a fantastic opportunity to engage with entrepreneurs and it's an international program so you get access to uh, an international network of, you know, businessmen and women who taught us so much about margins and profit and sustainability and, and made us realize that it's not enough to be fabulous, that, um, you know, you need to make money. And one of the speakers yesterday spoke about you know, um, getting to a stage of really understanding that it's about making money at the end of the day. Um, so I think in the next seven year period, because I believe everything works in seven year cycles, we are a lot more grown up about the decisions we make. It's not just about being fabulous and wowing the crowds at Fashion Week. Um, it's also, and it's not just about survival anymore, it's about being profitable. So we've learned a hell of a lot. Amanda, um, you've uh, own, co-own six space shops around South Africa, um, and you also distribute um, internationally. But um, you recently lost your business muse; she emigrated. Um, have you found a replacement? How important is it to have somebody like that? Um, well, I, I haven't really replaced her. It, uh, made a decision to buff up middle management so that um, collectively, as a team, we could get things done. Um, and it's of prime importance for me to have um, the nuts and bolts of the, of the business done so that I can be creative because if you're worrying about all the production and the fabric stretched or shrunk or 
um, the bottlenecks that you have uh, in well, any production, but clothing um, has its own innuendos, um, then you're not able to, to be as creative as you should be. Um, I think, Gavin, we're going to have a look at your recent Paris show. Um, and then after that, if you can tell us a bit about it. about, I mean, your, your, your hood couture collection puts you in a completely different business range. Can you tell us about the challenges of that in South Africa and internationally? I mean, you've got a huge international footprint as well. Um, I think internationally it's been quite interesting. I think one of the biggest things one has to overcome for coming from, any, from South Africa is actually just a stereotype. So, by the fact that I'm Indian and people expect me to do things that look like saris all the time, I, um, I also have to like kind of overcome the perception that everything I do is going to be leopard print or porcupine quills or some exotic kind of animal running around out there. Um, so I think from an international perspective, it's quite nice to actually be able to, um, to have actually change that in a little way. I think there's some people out there that still expect me to do those kind of things. Um, but I think what makes me successful in terms of having couture's, couture based in South Africa is number one, even though we do have a kind of very high labor kind of rate in terms of um, cost, labor intensive garments are still very, very, very cheap to actually make in South Africa. Um, we also have exceptionally skilled craftsmen and amazing seamstresses who really work in the pure kind of couture technique. So where a dress would cost, it costs a fraction of a price if I spend three hours, 300 hours making it, as opposed to actually having it made in Paris where they're paying a far more high kind of labor cost. Um, and also the fact that all, what, what I try to bring in, and if you saw in some of those images, you'd have seen, for instance, ostrich skin, and crocodile and stuff like that. And, and I'm not sure if many of you know, but basically all the ostrich you see in Dior and Celine and Dolce & Gabbana all come out of South Africa. And actually in 2005, I started working in terms of perfecting a technique to foil ostrich skin. And I used it in the collection you actually saw was a 2006 autumn winter couture collection. Um, and I used it in that collection. And actually now it's created quite a huge demand for it. In fact, I don't think they can kill ostriches fast enough. Um, but, um, uh, and especially foil them. Um, so, I mean, I try and, and see if I can integrate that into the collections and try and form partnerships within South Africa to create greater kind of export kind of product. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. Um, yes.